let's move on to the next section now that is the next chapter which has been titled the profaneness of stage now when we talk about profaneness of stage this is where we are going to actually talk about the stage representation the manner in which the stage has been represented how do you present these elements on stage is something that is the major concern for colia so how is this being taking place like what is the main is there a formula that i could actually represent i shouldn't be using formulas for english but is there a way in which i can represent this imbalance actually there is you can actually say that there is a sort of improportion which is there between the setting and the action so that means that the setting that is the main mood that is there in the by the elements that are being represented on stage and the act that the actors are performing on stage does not coordinate and you get to see that because where on the setting when one side you actually see that uh, the setting is that of a virtuous environment you're seeing a very holy environment maybe a church as i said before and you notice that the feel is very very religious on the other side what you notice is that people on the other end the act that the actors are performing is that they are shouting they're screaming and they're not really abiding by the feel or the mood that the setting is actually providing so if somebody shouts in a church it is unacceptable it is almost disrespecting it is disrespecting and that is what this was actually the trend that was being followed on stage which is what colia has addressed he has actually given the example of this representation by the example of a drama that has been written by john dryden it's called all for love now in this work what really happens is that you notice that the setting again is that of a chapel scene you notice that everything is very virtuous you notice chapel again is a very religious kind of mood that is being created by the setting and what you notice in the action is that the characters here are shouting and they are shouting words and expression their thought process is all against the mood that is being represented by the setting so they are go definitely going against religion and they are always giving significance to the evil representations that is the significance in this play is mainly given to hell so you notice that even the characters are respecting towards religion and the beliefs of morality because what one of the characters in the play really states is that heaven and on all eyes and no tongue so this expression itself is stating that individuals or the characters that are there on stage do not really give any regard to the belief of morality they think that there is no such thing as morality because virtue can in no way do anything for them it is almost without any uh, it doesn't provide assistance to humanity which is what the belief is there for these individuals and that is something that colia feels needs to be rectified this is something that is unacceptable and that is the manner in which the profaneness on stage is represented he gives a numerable uh, amount of a number of examples in this particular chapter which i'll not be addressing i am just giving a basic structure so that the understanding of this pamphlet becomes more clear and precise so after this perspective let's move on to the next perspective which is there in the third chapter that is titled as the clergy abused on by the stage now this is interesting that because we are talking about a particular individual from a particular field who is actually being abused and that is the clergy which is again giving a kind of a personal note about the person who is writing the pamphlet that is jeremy colia as i told you before he is a bishop so for him this is something again which is very unacceptable first thing that the bad characters are doing the wrong things on stage the second thing the virtuous characters are not able to stand for themselves they really do not have the strength and the third thing the people who are strong which is the virtuous person the religious person is also being abused on stage this is again very unacceptable and colia provides very strong reasons of justifying the real significance of these individual the messenger he actually addresses a good definition about what these people the clergy actually is for the humanity he calls 
these individuals the messenger of God. They provide assistance to humanity in delivering the message of God and instill moral conscience. So they are actually reforming you. They're actually giving you the true meaning of what religion actually is. They're giving you these good illusions, good representation that help you to become a good individual. That is the significance of clearly. It is so selfless. He really wants to do a humane thing without any selfish interest. That is the reason why Kolia is very, very showing a very deep concern for these individuals. And that is what he feels is wrong now. You are making the virtuous characters weak. All right. You are making the bad characters outshine. All right. And the third thing that you're doing besides this is that you're making the strong characters also, you're humiliating the strong characters too. You can notice that he's actually given the example of a work in which you notice that the religious people are actually being mocked by the other characters. For instance, this example I've already stated before, the country wife of William White Shirley, in which you notice that the prime character is actually somebody who is insulting a religious man. That is the way in which they have their regard for religion and the individuals who are representing religion. Always trying to ridicule them, mock them, and, and have utter no res just no respect for them, which is again something unacceptable for our pamphleteer, that is Jeremy Collier. And Kolik has given very strong argument against this by stating a very strong example about the Greek writers who are, in spite of the fact that they are representing tragedies, whether it is comedies, they are never fiddling or they never give disrespect to the people who are the messengers of God. Now, when we talk about the works that we are I'm actually trying to talk about, the first example that he talks about in terms of the ancient works or epics is a work which is very renowned and known, and many people are aware of this work. That is a very well-known epic written by the Greek writer who was considered to be blind. He is like uh, the Greek Milton, you could note, you can say in a way, and his name was Homer. The two epics that he is known for is the Iliad and the Odyssey. What is interesting in his work is that you notice that there is a very well-known epic, like the first epic that he wrote was the Iliad, and th that story moves on with the Odyssey. So in the Iliad, you notice that among the warriors, there is a very tyrant, very, very um, uh, egoistic warrior. His name is Agamemnon. What this warrior really does is that he insults a priest by disrespecting him and taking away his daughter, and insulting the gods that he is representing, that the priest is actually giving his devotion to. And what happens by this wrong deed of Agamemnon is that it infuriates the god that the priest was actually a devout follower of. The god that this priest actually gives reverence to is the god Apollo. And Apollo by noticing that his priest has been insulted by this warrior, is so, so infuriated that he actually brings about a plague. He starts throwing these strong thunderbolts on these individuals, in a way trying to show his wrath to their mortal men of the wrong deeds that they were trying to do with his messenger. So in a way, what Homer really tries to do in this act, even though he's trying to show that, yes, they are insulted, the priest is insulted by a very, very tyrant ruler, but he's also supporting that there, in a way, he's also giving a moralistic note that this is something that you cannot do because the priest is considered to be the messenger of God and you cannot mess with the messenger of God. He's somebody that you have to give respect to and you cannot go against him. Because God is really going to get in terms with you if you are going to mess with his messenger. Not only in this story, but there are other stories. Like the famous tragedian, Greek tragedian, his name is Sophocles. And his famous work that we all know about is in a trilogy that is about this Oedipus person. And the first collection of the work was called Oedipus Tyrannius. Even in this work, you notice that a very strong aspect of the priest has been represented. 
through the philosopher or prophet in a way, a, a kind of foreseer. His name is Tiresias. This is a very, very famous figure. He has been used by many modern writers, like T.S. Eliot mentions Tiresias in his very famous work that is called The Wasteland. And the reason why this person has been represented by many people because he, again, is a blind prophet. He is able to foresee the future of people even though he has no vision. So that is the power and the strength that this blind prophet really has. And what's unique in the story that he, we are actually talking about is that when the king is in a way appalled by knowing his future, that is Odysseus gets to know that he is going to commit a crime, that basically what happens is that Teresius tells this emperor, Oedipus, that you are going to do, you are actually going to commit something very wrong and you're going to be punished for it. Is that you are actually going to commit a kind of sensuous wrong act with your mother. You're actually going to have an affair and all these aspects have been declared to him about the wrong that he has performed unknowingly with his own mother, Jacosta. He has had an affair, he has had kids and he has killed his own father without even knowing about the things. After giving such revelatory answers, what is interesting is that Teresius is not at all scared, even though the emperor threatens to kill him. What you notice in this storyline is that Teresius is mainly known for his courage. He is fearless and he has prophetic power. So that is what Collier is trying to address, that in these Greek stories, you only see the strength of these prophets and these priests. You do not see them in a weak representation where they are being ridiculed or mocked. Even if they are being ridiculed, there is a kind of moralistic note always there because the people who ridicule them are punished and never been excused in any way. Not only in Greek, but also in other culture. He talks about many different countries where there is a lot of reverence given to priests and the, uh, or the messenger of God. Like, for instance, in France or Italy or Spain, all these countries have a lot of reverence given to their priests. They do give a lot of respect to them. And they are also holding very good positions in these countries. So they are considered among the hierarchy of very, very strong and superior individuals. So this is what Kolia is trying to address, that when you talk about such strong people, influential people, you should not in ridicule them, you should not try to make fun of them. And that is something very wrong that is being represented on the stage. This is what he actually tries to represent in the third chapter. That leaves us to the next chapter, that is chapter four. And the title of this chapter is, The Stage Poets Make Their Principal Persons Vicious and Reward Them at the End of the Play. So the title itself suggests we know what is going to happen here. What is happening is that you notice that there is a loss of moral conscience. Whatever these people are doing, they're always doing the wrong acts. They are never really doing the virtuous acts. And the play is always giving a kind of weightage to the wrong people. Which is the reason why Kolia makes this very strong kind of critique uh, on these people by saying that Lewd people have on the English stage no censure, no mark of infamy, no mortification, must touch them. So that is what is actually being represented. That means that the lewd people can do anything and everything when it comes to the English stage. There's nobody to check them, there's nobody to tell them that they're doing something wrong. It ain't going to happen. It's just not going to happen. And... To, in a way, again give an argument, he's stating the very good principle given by a Greek writer again, Horace, where he states that poetry must instruct moral value. So that is what is important. When you're really creating an art, it should give something that really leaves you into a good individual in the future. You should not give a wrong example through your work which is something that Kolia really wants that should be represented. Because even in the Greek works, he represents the very important aspect in the Greek plays, that is the very starting note. Because when the Greek plays usually start, there is a first kind of thing that is being represented, which is called the chorus. Now this chorus is always, even if the play is about wrong practice, or it has, it has got an immoral note, whatever be the thing, the most interesting thing is that the starting note, the first impression that is there on the play, is always about the main argument. 
the purpose for writing the play they are always trying to talk about the things that the society must follow the moralistic note is always given in the starting as well as in the ending this was a technique that was being used by many writers christopher marlo also uses the the use of chorus in his very famous work called dr faustus so this is something that is intriguing this is something that needs to be incorporated that you need to leave a moralistic note you cannot just always give the vicious character credit and that is what the restoration people were really doing and so this needs to be rectified according to colia so these are the aspects that he discusses in the fourth chapter the kind of always priority that is given to the wrong place that that brings us again now to the second last chapter that is remarks on amphitron king arthur don quixote and the relapse now what are these amphitron king arthur don quixote why are we talking about these works are we going to repeat ourselves again no the reason why this these type these works have been mentioned in the title is because these are the works that have been written by some writers in the past and they are in a way being refurnished almost like it is almost like a work that is being reproduced but in a new shape in a new manner and that is what is happening in most of the works like ephitron is actually a work that was initially written by the ancient writer his name is platus then this work was adapted by the french writer molière and later on in the restoration period john dryden took up the work now amphitron is mainly about a person he was a warrior the story starts in this way that this is about mistaken identity amphitron is a warrior who actually goes and his wife is in a way seduced by the very powerful greek god that is zeus he does that and what actually happens in the end is because of the mistake and identity because zeus is known for transforming his shape so he transforms his shape into this warrior amphitron that is what confuses his wife she has an affair with him later on there's a lot of confusion because when amphitron returns he notices that his wife is acting very very weirdly it's almost like she has no kind of feelings for a person who is coming all the way from from a war scenario she has no longing for him or anything she seems to be very normal and this in a way makes him very confused so there is a lot of confusion throughout the story and what you noticed is in the end when the stories are dis- this the story is actually the truth is actually disclosed zeus actually reveals the secret and he allows the lady to have both the kids so he the lady actually gives birth to two people one is a mortal and the other is immortal the immortal child is called hercules is named hercules so this is what is the story of this work and there have been numerous adaptations but what is interesting is that what dryden really tries to do with this storyline is that he tries to represent the powerful gods in a very negative picture even though they are committing something wrong but what dryden tries to suggest is that these people have no real strength because they are doing immorality so if they were if they can follow of immoral traits that means they do not really have the strength of doing anything as such so they can do whatever they want but the kind of representation that he is given to this greek god is something very defiled which again is trying to give a kind of disrespect to the greek gods and the greek culture by the way in which he was trying to represent the this greek god zeus he was trying to represent him in a very very bad picture he was trying to give very lewd and liberal representation to him which again is even though you're trying to modify your art you're really not doing it in a moralistic note again so is the case in many other works there's another example that of don quixote this again is a very famous work about this spanish man who is who thinks that he is a arthurian knight and he goes for his voyage in his very old rickety old horse and he takes along another servant with him which is known as sancho paza Pan- sancho is his companion whom he takes along with him in this journey so both of them lead for this journey and what you notice is that the way and the manner they, in which they have their experiences so the story altogether is very interesting again it's a old work but what is interesting is how the writer 
in this particular storyline again through the characters he is trying to again ridicule a very important person which is the priest in this particular story so the priest is in a way humiliated and insulted again so what you noticed in all these works even though they are modern adaptations of the old works they are always trying to inculcate new things in include new things but what they, they are really doing by including these new modification is that they are not adding any value to it because they are only including immoralistic notes in every storyline so this in way disrupts the very important thing that colia talks about that should be there in a play which is unity the three unities that is time action and place you are not following this principle because what you're doing is that you're over trying to overstretch the story you're trying to overstretch the plot and nothing really seems to be in the right order it's almost like an imbalance which is generated which is not giving you the idea of enjoyment or aesthetic pleasure in the right way in the moralistic way again so this is what is colia's concern in this particular work you're doing modern adaptation all right but you cannot do it at the cost of disrupting everything in it not only are you disrupting the story but you are also disrupting the basic principle of creating a work of art which is following the unities of time place and action which you are definitely disrupting by including more and more things just for the sake of increasing a kind of lewd enjoyment among the individuals All right. So that brings us now to the last chapter of this pamphlet which has been titled as The Opinion of Paganism of the Church and the State Concerning the Stage. What is interesting over here is the main concern that the society has in context to the stage. That is the only thing or the only people who need to be restrained from this influence are the youngsters because they are the one who are getting inspired they are getting influenced and they are practicing the wrong representation that are being represented on stage so this is the major concern for everybody whether it was the greeks or whether it was the people in the previous ages that is the renaissance age or the age before restoration but not restoration because people did want to control this censure this thing and you can notice this because colia provides examples of emperors and rulers who have tried to control this kind of licentiousness that was being practiced by the stage like for instance during the reign of queen elizabeth there had to be an order that had to be passed that the theater group that was performing had to move outskirts so these were the things that were being imposed on the theater group they were forced to move out of their usual surroundings because they were definitely bringing about a wrong influence on the people and the only way in which this thing could be rectified was that they had to be shifted in the outskirts so that was the one thing that was being followed by during queen elizabeth's reign and the other example that has been provided is that of a french emperor who also had to order the people who were enacting or doing because the people who were now performing doing the stage activities during his reign were the italian players he had to stop them from he ha- in fact he ordered them to retire from their particular task that they were performing that is the acting and the theater group that they were doing because the kind of things that they would do was in a way always trying to they were trying to insult the monarchy they were trying to insult the notions that were being dictated to them or told to them and that is the reason why many emperors and many people have actually tried to control them because this was the major concern for all the people before restoration that they wanted to control the theater groups who were giving a long wrong kind of influence to the people the youngsters and to state the moralistic note he provides the common link that is to be seen in pagan philosophers the ideologies of the pagan philosophers and even the moralistic notes that are being represented in the bible he has given references of these moralistic notes in the first context let's just talk about the greek philosophers first like for instance he has provided certain examples of these philosophers who have always always tried to give a kind of moralistic note who have always tried to guide their society in terms of reforming themselves like plato we have already done who who asked 
the society to banish the poets. That is the only way in which they can improve and modify themselves. Then Xenophon was again a kind of philosopher of the time who actually asked that, the, to, that there is a need to develop discipline and that can only be th there through education. We need to educate the people, to educate the masses and that's how we are going to uplift ourselves. Last but not the least, there's also references of Aristotle who believed that this is the one thing that we need to do is that we need to forbid the young people, the youngsters from watching comedies because they are the ones who are being most impacted by the wrong that is being represented on the stage. So this was the major concern of all these philosophers and they represent a very good note. Even in the book of Ezekiel, if you look at it, that is again a part of the Bible, which also states a very interesting point regarding these things, which is advising the society to do something good. I'm quoting from the lines where the book again is providing a very moralistic note to those individuals who are getting very much persuaded by the bad influence that is provided by these theatrical or stage representations. He states that refine our inclinations and change our delights into aversion. He tells us we must decline the theatres and all the dangerous diversions which stain the innocence and soul and slip into the will through the senses. So what he's really trying to do and suggest over here is that there is a need to control the desires. And that can only happen because this was the one guidance that, were, that was being provided to the people who were actually on their way from Egypt to the new world or the new direction that the people in, in this particular book, that is the book of Ezekiel, that, that was the first guidance that was being provided to these people. That if you really want to do well, you need to first give away the delights and you need to actually take in the good moralistic notes that are being provided. That requires effort and you need to do that and that can only be done when you're leaving the wrong influences behind you. And the first wrong influence here is definitely the theatre. So that is what you need to do, leave that and only then are you going to reform everything, reform every individual around you and live a very, very good human life, a virtuous life, which is what is the main goal for Jeremy Collier. He's not critiquing these writers for some personal indifference or a kind of uh, antagonism towards them, but because whatever these writers are trying to represent is something that is never giving that kind of wrong, vir right virtue to the people around. It is always providing them the wrong example, the wrong beliefs, the wrong aspects are being represented. And the first people who are being influenced by this are the youngsters who have to be guided, who have to be told the right thing, which is why the last note in the last chapter is mainly in context to the, the actual people who need to be really guided is the youngsters, because they are the one who are really being, in a way, disturbed and influenced by this influence. What is interesting is the last note that Collier provides in his pamphlet, which is in a way suggesting that if we are really going to work out, if we really want to do something good, that can only happen if we have a faith in God. We need to have a faith in God and that can only happen if we are moving in the right direction, we are leaving all these influences behind and that's the only way in which we can improve ourselves. And so the last note that Collier really states is that, "'Tis true, as long as there is life, there's hope. Sometimes the force of argument and the grace of God and the anguish of the affliction may strike through the prejudice and make their way into the soul. So it is definitely a, a very, very, you require effort to, to take this plunge or to reform yourself and do really something that can really improve and reform people. It is a long process, but he does believe that this can happen because if you have faith in God, then maybe this is something Rather, he's confirmed, he's very definite that this will happen if and only you try to reform yourself and do the right. So that leaves us with the final note that Kolia has stated. And I hope this lecture has helped you because this is what Kolia is trying to represent in this whole pamphlet. The need to rectify the errors that are being there on stage. And we have seen the different perspectives that he provides us in context to the errors that was there during the restoration period. 
This final note of Kolia brings us to the end of this lecture. I hope you enjoyed it. You had fun watching the slides, the way in which I had represented my idea and thought. I couldn't have done it without having you good listeners, patient listeners who are there and listening to my audios. So thank you for doing that. And I hope to see you soon in the next week with a new lecture. Until then, stay tuned. Do subscribe if you're new to my channel and like and comment and give your opinions. Don't forget, again, another thing that I've forgotten, that is the belly. Please latch on to that bell too, because that is something that will keep you updated about the lectures that I am updating at a regular basis now, almost weekly. So I hope to see you in the next lecture where we will understand, analyze and interpret the important texts that will help you to understand literature better and enjoy and also master that English. That's me, Karishwa, signing off for now. Have a very good day ahead. Bye-bye.